Thank you, everyone. Um, time will kill us all in the end. It's, uh, and the little time that we have here on Earth, we spend writing data pipelines. Uh, one of my favorite things to do on the, in the professional aspect is to come here to this conference uh, because it's such a technical audience. You can really geek in on something and, and go deep. And uh, this year, I've chosen to geek in on the troubles that time might cause and how to deal with them. So at some point, I saw a couple of slide or a couple of graphs that looked like this. These graphs tend to freak people out, in particular if you're at the dip and somebody had launched a campaign or launched in a new country or something. I've also seen a graph that looks like this. There is a mysterious dip, like at midnight every day. Doesn't seem to match what we expect. Or this a mysterious bump in the middle of the night. Wondering what that what that might be. Or this one, uh, only premium users are supposed to access premium services, but apparently some free users do that, but then they stop at midnight, and then they start again. That's weird. These are examples of things that uh, do not really match what the users did, but are caused by our mismanagement of, of time and data processing pipelines. So I will mention a bunch of issues that I've seen, a bunch of anti-patterns where we have dealt with things badly, and a couple of patterns that I have come to conclude to, uh, to uh, use in order to mitigate the problems. These are quite, I'm quite opinionated in my patterns, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, my hope is that you will become more aware of the issues that might uh, occur, and that I will share some of the tools that I have in my toolbox. First, looking at uh, what, from a time perspective, what different types of data we have. We have facts. These are either events that happen or like observations, measurements out in the wild. Uh, these have a timestamp. They happen at a particular time, and uh, they come in a, like a continuous stream. We don't really control the time. Something else does. We also have state that we have in our system, and uh, we have uh, usually dumped to a data lake. I'll explain why later. Uh, and these are typically dumped at, at like regular intervals, uh, like daily or hourly or something. And then we have claims, which is a statement about something that ha has happened previously. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples uh, in a while. And these claims always have a, windows, a time window of scope, like they are claims about a particular time period. These events and state dumps and, and uh, claims have different time scopes. It's more, mostly complicated for, for events. You have the event time, the time at which the event occurred. And then you have some registration time, when you see the event coming in to your backend systems where you can trust the clocks. And then you have the ingestion time, where, which is when you put it into your data lake for, for eternal preservation. Uh, in a single DC environment, the registration and ingest is usually the same time. In a multi-DC environment, you might have a propagation delay. And then later, we process the data, so we have a processing time as well. For, for state, we only have the ingest time. And then for claims, we have the, what I call the domain time, the time scope which the claim refers to. For example, these were the users that we thought were fraudulent during this particular time window. We use clocks to measure time. They don't actually really tell us what time it is. They tell us how much time has elapsed. Uh, and, but in order to deal with them, we first tell them what time it is, and then we get a, a new measurement back. We have clocks that are of high quality, usually our backend stuff. Clocks that are of low quality, like in IoT devices, mobile devices, and so forth. We also have wrong clocks, which is when we look at the different time scope than the one we actually care about. Sometimes this is OK. We use the wrong time scope as a proxy. Um, and some clocks we control. Some clocks uh, we can trust in their value, uh, evaluation, their measurement of time, but we don't really control the, how they are set in terms of time zones and so forth. Clock time maps to calendars, which is a, like a, more of a human invention uh, that maps to, to the, the astronomical and social domains. And if I were to ask my son how uh, the definition of a calendar, this is what he might come up with. This is also what a computer comes up with, if you, if you ask it naively. Now, reality is more difficult. 
In a naive calendar, you might think that these properties hold. Like a day has a certain number of seconds. If you go uh, 45 years in the future, you end up in what year you're at, plus 45. Uh, if you st start at the beginning of the year and you go 30, 364 days forward, you think you might end up in December. Uh, if you go 60 minutes forward, you might end up in the next hour, you think. Uh, and if you shift time zone, you would perhaps think that you at most shift a day and that the number of minutes is preserved. And if you're at December 29th, you might think that the next day is December 30th, or that January or February has like 28 or 29 days. Now I'm going to test you. How Obviously, since I put them up, these are at some point in time wrong. How many people can find at least one counterexample for these things? That's low. Uh, how many people can find at least two? Keep your hands up. At least three. At least four. <laughs> at least five. Six. Ah, oh, there it dropped. <laughs> it's not so easy. I had to Google a bit on this one. The first one is the leap seconds. Second one is year zero. After year minus one comes year plus one in historical time counting. There's an astronomical, just to confuse things, where there is a, a year zero. Uh, there was a switch between Julian and Gregorian calendars. Uh, when, you might ask? Well, it stretched over 300 years in different countries, and it stretched all the way into the 20th century. Daylight savings time you're familiar with. Time zones are not, uh, not really on a full hour, and they span more than uh, 24 hours. Some countries jump back and forth between uh, on the date line, so they sometimes skip a day. And I proudly present the only country to have had the 30th of February. This was as part of the confusion in the Gregorian, uh, Julian Gregorian calendar switch. Fortunately, you don't have to know most of these things. They rarely come up unless you're dealing with historical data. Leap seconds might come up. It took down a couple of, of big sites a few years ago. Uh, for data processing, it's probably not a huge deal. You might have to prepare that the, that the timestamps might have the second number 60. Rather than that, you should, are probably fine. If you're in Google, they smear the leap seconds out. Very elegant solution. I don't know what the other cloud providers do. Daylight savings time, on the other hand, that for sure will bite you. Um, and it even kills people, are you aware? That the, in spring, when you lose an hour, there's an elevated number of heart attacks. And uh, there's a lower number of heart attacks in autumn, but they don't add up. So daylight savings time kill people. And of course, daylight, daylight savings time is the uh, uh, explanation for this kind of graph, where suddenly the, hour ha ha the, the day has like 24 hours, and there's a corresponding dip in the autumn. Now, how might this affect technical systems? This is a scenario we had uh, recently. This is a uh, typical ingestion pattern called the loading dock. You have a legacy system. It pushes data on a regular basis, in this case hourly, to a, a neutral ground, a file system, or a Google Cloud bucket, in this case. And the ingestion mechanism pulls it in, copies it to the data lake. Usually. The legacy systems are more difficult to change, so you adapt to whatever conventions they have and just accept them. In this case, uh, by the way, I included some uh, Luigi uh, workflow code, because uh, I've, um, I've seen people stumble with these types of patterns. So here's an example. You can get the slides later if you want. In this case, it turned out that the timestamps were local time including local time zone, which doesn't matter all that much until the sh there's a shift. And then in spring, suddenly there's one hour missing. And then in autumn, if we write the code, the workflow code this way, uh, it will pick up the first data set, it will ignore the second data set, and we have a, a silent data loss. You can compensate these either on the source systems, by not including the daylight savings time or the time zone, or by, uh, with some hacker, of course, in the receiving system. So one principle that I try to push to, to all the clients and people that I work to, with is to separate the online world from the offline world. In the online world, 
Processing time and event time are tightly connected. You process things right away after they happen. In the offline world, you process them later. With streaming, just a little later. With batch, perhaps much later. And it can be tricky when you mix these worlds due to the different time scopes. When you're batch processing, there are a number of principles essentially inherited from functional programming that I have found to be really valuable and to adhere to to make things simpler. I will explain why these are uh, so important in the very end. Uh, essentially, you want your batch process to be a pure function. It should be a, the output should be a function only of the input and of the code, of nothing else. Not state in databases, no randomness, no wall clock time, don't look at the processing time, and so forth. And you want the amount of input data to be known and bounded. This is a common like, beginner mistake in data uh, processing environments that I see often. We process whatever data happens to be in this bucket or in this BigQuery data set, and so forth. In order to achieve this, if you want state from a database, we cannot query the database, so therefore we dump the database to the lake on a regular basis. It seems simple. I've seen uh, l lots of ways to fumble with this. One is to direct your cluster to dump from the database, which is fine if the data is small, but if the data is large, this is uh, essentially a denial of service attack. This is one of my oldest slides, as you can tell from the references to Scoop and MapReduce. Uh, some of you might have seen it before. Uh, I've seen a couple of systems go down this way. And you're essentially mixing up the, the offline world separation of processing time, where processing time and event time are separated into the online world where, where they are the same. And the offline world wants all of the events at once and process it as soon as possible. So here's a, a, a pattern, corresponding pattern that you can do. You are very careful taking the data to the offline world. And, in, and I recommend using some kind of replica. You can have a live replica. In this case, you, yeah, I suggest taking the, the backups from your databases, restoring in an offline database, and you have separated the online and the offline world. Now, what do you want to do with your snapshots? In many cases, you want to decorate your events. You have your users in the database, and your, all of your events have a user ID, so you want to decorate and, and uh, throw some demo demographic information in there and so forth. But the events are a continuous stream, continuous over time. And this, the snapshots that you have come at regular intervals. So when you join, you will always join information from two different times. So this, you can usually live with this. This is acceptable, but you need to be aware. And it's often easier to have the mismatch in only one direction. It's, it's common to, to join with a previous snapshot of, of the user database, for example. Otherwise, you have to wait for an hour or 24 hours. But this mismatch is what causes graphs like this. Because here, the user who was free a free user here, upgraded to premium here, and then started using premium services here. But when you join, you have the mismatch and you have this weirdness. As long as you're aware, it's usually fine. If you're doing batch, you, your events are bucketed into batches. And if that batch doesn't really align with the dump time of the database, you might end up with having wrong information in two time directions. Usually OK, but if you care about being, the data being wrong in only one direction, you might want to shift this window. On a couple of occasions, I've tried to understand a complex system where, and the different, um, different situations with, with, with how we bucket and where the data is copied from and, and yada yada. And perhaps we can align to make the error smaller and the result has always been, no, because of some reason we're screwed anyway, we just live with the, with the information loss. You can avoid this by adopting a paradigm called event sourcing where you say that the, the state in databases is not the truth. The only truth out there is the history of events that has happened. And we do use databases, but they are just a cached view of a certain aggregation of the history of events. Now, if you only look at, if you join now, 
you can choose to play as many events as you want to, to, to match the time where you want to join. So that you don't have these mismatches anymore. Unfortunately, this makes your code significantly more significantly more complex. You don't, can no longer just look up in, in a table and, and do a plain join. At this point, any streaming fans might say, well, this, these are problems specific to batch, right? If we stream, we can update a table all the time and join with that table. So, great, we have one stream with the, with the user events here, perhaps, and we have some other stream with, with the service uh, events, or the plane of the films, or whatever. So we just update this table in the middle and join with that, whatever state is in that table. And this will give you the right data under the naive assumption that these streams are in sync. In practice, it's difficult to make streams be in sync. So every join here will be a race condition to see which event goes first to the table. But let's continue on the streaming track. In order to avoid these types of race conditions, you usually look at windows uh, when you're doing stream processing, whether you're doing aggregations on the left or whether you're uh, joining here on the right. In, in stream, you, only, you kind of look at uh, larger windows of time on, on both the streams and try to match them. Uh, you have some choices when, when uh, making the windows. You have to choose whether to do sliding windows or tumbling windows and so forth. In addition to this, you have to cho choose what to window over. Which time? Or, in the upper case here, the number of events is also an option. The early stream processing systems were only supporting like number of events and processing time. Now, those, those are easiest to implement, but often not uh, necessarily what you need, because you have a trade-off here with the, the size of the window and the accuracy. And if you, if you um, window over a number of events, for example, then if there's a spike in events, your effective time window will shrink. Or if you window over processing time, you lose the nice pro um, property of reproducibility. If you ever try to replay again, you will get a different result, which breaks these functional principles that I happen to like a lot. So lately, we've seen support for joining or for windowing over event time instead, which is usually what you want from a business logic perspective. Unfortunately, you no longer know how much resources you need. If you have a spike, then your resource, your memory consumption will, will rise. And if you have odd event times, like some bad clock stating that it, it is now next year, then you will f suddenly flush all of your windows and not do what you want. So you have to do some time to check and so forth. So no matter what you do, you have some interesting trade-offs, and this is not so easy. If anybody still thinks that this might be easy, I suggest you watch Håkon Omlo's talk from, from last year, which could have been titled uh, it is surprisingly difficult to join two streams, but it wasn't. It had another title. Lots of interesting learnings. So let's try and see if we can uh, sort of do better with batch instead and, and, and see how many problems we can avoid in the batch world. We take the events in, we, we put them into like hour buckets, for example, or daily buckets. So we need to Again, we need to decide to window over what, because these, these buckets are also windows. And also we need to decide when, we, when it, these windows, these buckets are complete. When can we start to, the processing downstream? So this is a data collection system I was working with from many years ago. We had uh, logs going, events going down of files in the different services, and we uh, partition them by hour, and we copy them with, with rsync or SSH. This even predates the existence of Kafka, hence the uh, ancient tools. Uh, and then we uh, put them over there in hourly buckets, and then we decided to start the processing when all of the hosts had reported their data. Now, as the number of hosts grew, this got more and more fragile, and we were processing later and later and later. Not scalable. And we were trying to add 
add on various hacks with looking at the monitoring system to figure which holes were up or down and so forth, and it just got more and more and more complex. And we all had the feeling, this is not supposed to be this complex, and, and it isn't. But we d didn't figure that out at the time. So another Swedish company had another trick. They, they optimistically started the batch processing downstream when the hour was through, and then they measured how much new data has arrived. And I mean, if it went over a certain threshold, they triggered a reprocessing downstream, uh, which is also not great, because then you have a data collection determined or decided for every use case downstream what the quality requirements were, which worked for one or two use cases, but it didn't work uh, in the end for, for many use cases. There are tools and structures where you can do reprocessing. Uh, Google is, is doing something along these lines, but they have very good internal tools. Uh, we, they've exposed some of that tooling in, ter in terms of Apache Beam, where you can say, hey, now I now have an updated data set, and so forth. Um, the, I have so far uh, not used or deselected those tools uh, because it turns your batch processing operationally into a stream. And, and batch is much easier from an operational perspective. So I try, try to stay with batch as much, much as I can. There are also tools in terms of versioning. You, you generate new versions of data sets downstream and so forth, or, or in provenance, keeping really good track of what was used for what and so forth. Uh, I, again, try to avoid those tools uh, because I feel that the, with the tooling that exists today, the, the cure is worse than, worse than the disease. And I think there are simpler patterns. So uh, here's what I try to do these days. We have some different times, scopes that we can choose to bucket from, and just choose the closest one, the ingestion time. Because if you do that, it's a local clock in the cl system closest to the data lake. And that means that you can close and seal the data sets very quickly after the, the hour is through. So you can start processing at that point. So you don't have these situations where we're waiting for more data before processing. Unfortunately, if you're doing analytics, it leads to graphs like the upper one. And then, per use case, you decide if that dip comes, what do you want? Do you want to see the dip with the data that you have, or do you want to wait until you have better data. You can decide whether you have better or not based on the event time. This should be a decision per use case. And in, the, in a dashboard, we might want both. But, but for machinery downstream, we have to make a choice. And this is what it might look like. Luigi code to the left, Spark code on the right. We, if we want to wait and get better data, we delay the processing with n number of hours. And then in the, in the Spark code, we just, uh, we just take all of the wider window, shuffle, and spit out the, the hour that we're actually interested. But since we waited for a while, we have some more, better data. What if we're wrong? We might be wrong. And that's OK as long as we know how wrong we are. So we count whenever our assumptions fail. Then, and the data goes, uh, the event time falls out of the window that we're looking at. We count that as a count. So after the fact, if we have a report, we might know whether it was a good report or not. And if it wasn't, we can increase the delay hour. And we compute different delay hours for, to cater for all the use cases that we have. So we usually do a fast one without delay. Delay hours equals zero. Uh, and then some more. And for the, for the, really, for the cases where um, quality is really important, like fin financial reporting and so forth, we wait for a really long time. So then we have some kind of Lambda architecture in batch. Usually the Lambda architecture is, is you, have, you assume that your streaming is unreliable, so you redo the same thing in batch. Here, we assume that the first batch processing is unreliable because it doesn't have all the data, so we add another one or two or, or more pipelines on the side. Uh, this might seem complex. It's actually not because you can essentially reuse all the code and just uh, twitch a parameter. I've been in cases where we have dealt with, with like financial reporting, 
and also some new data sets come in afterwards, like the, like the, the fraudulent users or, or something that we want to include in, in the high quality reporting. So this, uh, and that's shown in this example here. So those fraudulent users are examples of data that is delayed not by machinery, but by humans. Claims is also a form of data that is delayed by humans. The humans on inside your company or outside your company have not yet figured out what they are supposed to claim, like right? Compensa economical compensation or whatever. And this might come very late. I've had, I've had scenarios where, according to the contrast, contracts, uh, external parties might, two years after the fact, come and claim things, and we have to deal with that. So you can't wait two years un until you spit out reports. So you want preliminary reports, but at the end, after all claims, you want accurate reports. And as I've explained already, reprocessing, no good. Instead, what you do is to explicitly model the time domain, or the domain time, and the uh, registration or arrival time. So for each uh, domain time scope in the past, like, like the March this year, you have each day build a report, a data set, that states what you knew about that window in time on this particular day. And then tomorrow we do another computation if new things have arrived about what we knew, at, uh, what we knew on this day about that time. That, this turns out to make the whole thing deterministic and explicit, and it also allows us to go back and, uh, and audit things afterwards. The dependency tree might blow up in these cases, so, so your, your workflow orchestrator might have a bit difficult time, and there are, you can do hacks to make the, the tree sparse instead and so forth. In some cases, it turns out to be uh, convenient to depend on yesterday's data set. We ha I had, this is also one of recent examples where we are do looking at stock in, in a store, and we are getting updates with you know, new stocks, but only for a portion of the stock, so we aggregate by just taking the latest information for a particular stock item. Uh, and if you depend on, on yesterday's data, then you have a recursive infinite dependency to, to some kind of starting point. This is usually OK, but it represents an operational risk. If you decide at some point that you need to, this was, these calculations are wrong, you need to go and backfill, then you need to go back all the time. Uh, this has, often you can get away with this. I've had a number of occasions where this was actually a practical problem and caused days of delay for, for financial reporting and so forth. So there is a mitigation here uh, that I used at some point, which is to do the recursion in jumps. So for every first of the month, I, I wrote a, a job that depended on the first of the last, last month and then everything in between, and then so forth, which made you stride quicker forwards in time. And then for the other days of the month, you just depend on the first and whatever was incremental. So it, it's kind of like MPEG encoding where you have wireframes and P-frames and, and things. And this cuts down the, the, the operational risk here. In some cases, your business logic detects that you need to look back in time in order to, to uh, figure out what the output should be. And the simplest example is, is sessions, where you have users that click on your web page or, or you use your mobile phone uh, and so forth. And uh, you, need to, you want to clump, lump that into sessions with, with, of a certain length and, and so forth. This is an example I, I take. In, I hold courses every once in a while. This is an example I, I take in order to make people think about dependencies. Uh, so let's say, uh, let's say that you have a, uh, defin this, this definition of sessions. So which hours of data do you need in order to figure out the sessions here? Well, if for this definition you need infinite history, because the sessions might be very long. Well, long sessions might not make sense, they're bots anyway, so you might do a cut off here and say that no more than three hours. Good, ex excellent. You, now you, th you might think that you need only four hours of data, and, and the sessions will look something like this. It turns out if you go to the border here, uh, you have a session in the beginning, but you nevertheless don't know whether that session started at that point or not. 
So depending on the history back, you, you might have a cutoff date or not, and so forth. This might be a contrived example, but it illustrates that it is often difficult to figure out how much data you actually need, what time window you actually need in order to do a particular job. And this graph that we saw, where there was like a 10% dip at midnight, was a failure to realize that we needed more data than we actually thought we needed. Uh, what to do about it? Well, you can do the recursive strides, as, as mentioned previously, and just take all of the data, uh, but express it in a different way. Or you can introduce like limits, you know, cut all the sessions at midnight or something that align you to your artificial batch boundaries, and then you, you are uh, losing some information, but you are making it more practical and deterministic. It depends on your use case. Why do I care about so much about these properties of reproducibility uh, and functional properties like immutability and, and so forth? These are some aspects that I have found that not so many people follow, but turn out to be really to really make a difference in whether you get value from your data engineering or not. I've learned to gravitate heavily towards simplicity and towards slow data. So I always use batch processing if I can get away with it, if the use cases uh, can handle it uh, or handle the latency, because the cost of operations is much smaller. And the smaller cost of operations mean that you can innovate faster and move faster. Well, in this presentation, I've focused on techniques for de defending these functional architectural principles, and I've solved some of the problems that are bumped up with workflow orchestration. Why are these principles so important? Because they support high team concurrency. We have learned that immutable data and, work and expressing things in, in f uh, pi functional pipelines is good for thread concurrency and for computational concurrency. It turns out that immutable data sets and data pipelines as the means of collaboration allows for high team concurrency. Different people can work with the data without applying organized operational risk on the teams that own the data, because the data is immutable and, and so forth. And reproducibility cuts down your operational risk, because if you tr need to rerun things, you know that you get the same thing. So you can remove things and rerun them as you, as you want. And uh, there's some, sometimes talk about the reproducibility crisis and so forth. And uh, this, this is... Um, this crisis is aggregated by or increased by failing to comply with these principles. Um, in order to do machine learning on a repeatable, uh, in order to get lots of value from machine learning in your products, you need to be able to run many experiments. And if you run experiments and they are not reproducible, then you don't know whether your change made a difference or whether it was different data or just some, some of the face of the moon or something that affected uh, the results. And the democratization of data and the ability to collaborate is the real value of big data. It's not the size of the data. It's not the machine learning and the shining things. This is what, in all of the organizations that I've seen, is what makes the big difference. The, you, that you're breaking down silos. You don't have to coordinate with lots of people because the, da the data is readily available. And that's why I zoom in and focus on these things. Some credits, some good timing libraries that I usually use. And if you are uh, having questions about the, the uh, batch versus streaming and the operational trade-offs and so on, I have a presentation about that that you might want to watch. It seems that we do have a few minutes for questions. Who has got some questions? Please put your hand up, otherwise I cannot see you. No? Come on, it was a really exciting talk, so. <laughs> yes. How do you deal with um, 
like when the members of a team wants to do streaming because it's cool and oh yeah <laughs> i'm very much down to earth and i have i used to love complexity right but i started in, in big with big data stuff fairly early so now i hate the complexity uh and um so of course so in there are cases where, uh, where streaming is the right trade-off, right? You need the low latency, and that's fine. Uh, and also, you usually have some kind of streaming in your, in your data collection pipeline, about <laughs> Kafka, so forth. Um, I find that you need to have a cultural balance and sufficient focus on value delivery and product ownership and business value focus represented in the teams. If you throw a bunch of engineers uh, away to do something, they're going to do really cool things. So the successful teams that I've worked with have had a balance of engineering, domain expertise, and product ownership, and in the cases of machine learning, a data science component. Yeah. I've never been in a successful team that delivers feature that was not cross-functional. Anybody else? Yes. You talk about workflow orchestration, but I mean, it's still quite problematic to find a scheduler that does all the workflow orchestration for you. Do you have any recommendations? There are two reasonable options. Uh, there is uh, the examples that I showed here is, is Luigi from Spotify. The other reasonable option is Airflow from Airbnb. Uh, I've not seen any other uh, reasonable options. Um, those are uh, both implemented in Python. You need a real language in order to express the things that are non-trivial. So many of the examples that I put up here, if you go to something like Uzi, you cannot express them. Um, which one should you take? Well, I, I'm biased. I, I, I used Luigi since long before Air, Airflow existed. Um, the, uh, it kind of depends on whether you are a buy things or build things organization. Uh, Airflow is, has a wider scope. It gives you some monitoring, it gives you the, the scheduling mechanism, and, and, and so forth. Luigi has a narrower scope, it's a Unix philosophy tool, uh, do thi one thing well. But it also, it's more versatile in the sense that it allows you to express uh, more complex things. So if, if you were good at Airflow, you were probably able to express some of the things I showed you, but some of the things would be difficult. But I, I'm not, I don't use Airflow, so I'm not an expert. But those are your two options. And thanks. Anybody for the last question? No? Perfect. Thank you very much. It was amazing. <laughs>